Um, okay, so I said no stocks and no weather. How many of you think, who thinks, who can speculate why I'm saying no stocks, no weather? Anyway. The information to grab is extremely, it's extremely easy to grab that information or find that information. Yeah, it's well hanging fruit. And I also think that it's not just that it's easy to find, I think that, I think that it's actually um, part of your job as an artist or designer is to have a kind of point of view about something you're interested in. And if you're interested in stocks and weather, that's, that's like, that, that's, that's like um, uh, you're really out of ideas, you know, or, or it's just it's too low hanging fruit. It's like, it's like it's right there for you and, and, and you know, it's like, it's like that's, that's like the kind of stuff you talk with someone who, like you just met, like, go, like, oh, hey, it's like, like check out the weather, you know, like, like look at that storm, it looks like a big, big, big storm, you know. It, it's too easy. I want you guys to go find data that means something to you. Maybe make data that means something to you. So for this coming assignment, if you're doing something with information visualization, I'll point you to resources. There's now amazing databases online. You know, there's all kinds of APIs, there's all kinds of databases, there's all kinds of data collections and sets. You can work with APIs like Twitter and Flickr. You can work with APIs like Open Government. You can work with data sets like you can't even believe. You can download large pieces of data. You can you can uh, you can even collect your own data. You know, if you want to like you know, scrape your navel and like you know count the pieces of lint or whatever. I, I don't care. But 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 go make data or find data that means something to you. That's that's, that's kind of the part that I'm interested in here. Um, what did I want to say about that? Well, that's kind of what I'm going to show you this morning. So I, what I wanted to talk about this morning was um, this is going. I think first of all, uh, I pulled out the vorpal sword of, of like of information visualization lectures. It's like a three-hour lecture. No way we're going to get to it, and if I, if I gave it to you, you'd quickly exhaust all the coffee in the room and possibly the building. Um, the, uh, the, main, the main thing is, is that, um, I don't know what I want to say. The, uh, this lecture, I, I think I have to split it over two days, so we'll, we'll kind of pick up some more of it on Wednesday. Today we're going to talk about the stuff which is like actually, what does it mean to to sort of to, to like look at the world and see the world in ways and in new, new eyes and sort of make machines for us that, that show us ourselves or, or show us the world in a new way. I thought of a second rule for the, or third rule if you like, for the, the information visualization assignment, which is I prefer that if you did this that you use more than a, more than a hundred or possibly a thousand pieces of data. I'd like to, I'd like you to find data where you, you couldn't just kind of lay it out by hand, but there has to be some kind of some kind of algorithm or, or program you have to write in order to do to do the, the project. You guys follow? Because like, I mean, it, it, I have in the past actually taught a course that was called Information Visualization of the Mode of Art Practice. And um, when I taught that course, I had a mixture of students, some of whom knew how to code, some of whom didn't. And there I would actually allow completely analog assignments, you know, like just made with like paper and scissors or you know cameras and things like that. And that's cool, but because this class is really about a computational approach to thinking, I, I really want you guys to use um, your coding skills, however advanced or, or rudimentary they are, to approach problems where you're really dealing with like more data than, than you can practically handle. And I think for me, the threshold is like around 500 things. Like if I'm laying out five, you know, like more than 500 things, I'm like, this is crazy. You know, even like 200 is kind of insane. So, so we really want to deal with like something like you know, you have more than 200, more than 500 pieces of data. You got to write code for that. And nowadays, in the so-called era of big data, it's not hard to find, okay? Um, so today I want to talk about um, data visualization, and there's many, many different kinds. Um, you guys have probably been out on some of the blogs, and you guys checked out the blogs I pointed you to for information visualization, infosthetics, visualizing.org, uh, visualcomplexity.org, and you've seen all the different kinds of projects that are out there. There are maps, there are diagrams and charts, there are networks. These are some of the basic kinds of, of visualizations that you'll see. Um, you'll also see collections, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you will see strategies for information visualization, especially in a dynamic context, uh, allowing people interactively to do four basic operations, the zoom, sort, filter, and query. Right? But these, these form a structure for thinking about data visualization in terms of like, um, you know what? What is it? Oh, it's a chart, or it's a map. Or, you know, what can I do with it? I can I can zoom, I can sort, I can filter, I can query. So those are those are some of the basic operations we're going to talk about. But to begin with, I thought I'd just kind of start with a kind of light introduction to this. Now, Michael, are you recording this one? Uh, yes. I've gotten requests from our friends who are joining the class remotely.
to uh, to share this one. Okay, it's going to be a big file. That's so fine. I guess we can deal with How big is the file? Like gig? Uh, yeah. That's fine. Let's let's talk after class about it. What's that? We can knock it down. Knock it down. Um, we can knock it down. We can also yeah. Okay, so some thoughts about information visualization. I'm going to start with some real analog stuff. Um, here's you know some just to kind of warm you guys up. Some some stuff off the interwebs. Um, you know, uh, what's kind of lovely about this example is actually, it's just, it, it's actually, it's really 100% true, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of an air of truth to this thing, it's undeniable. That literally is a visualization of what it says it is, it claims to be. Um, uh, so is this, in, in its own way. Um, you probably, you've probably seen things like this. So let's just, you know, let's begin with the humble pie chart. Now, even even with a humble pie chart, we can, we can have sort of things like this that, that uh, Kind of have some kind of truth and, and some kind of humor to them as well. Um, I don't know if any of you know who Mr. T is or was, but um, there's a portion of this that reminds me of Mr. T, and there's a portion that still kind of reminds me of Mr. T. There's a, a very small amount of this pie chart here that resembles a butt crack. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, but um, they are a num there are four turtles who are named after uh, Renaissance artists. If you do a little Google search, and you'll find this. Uh, um, this was actually an old, old XKCD, actually, uh, in which if you search for those four names, uh, you, can, you can see the extent to which uh, they have notoriety as a Renaissance artist or a Ninja Turtle. This actually begins to kind of get it at something I, I want to talk about in this class, which is kind of using data visualization to examine culture in a way. Um, you know, Michelangelo, we, really? No, Leonardo, we primarily know, and Raphael, we primarily know as Renaissance artists, right? But Donatello, we seem to, to know more, um, be, be more familiar with Donatello at, in, in his existence as a Ninja Turtle. Um, and that's okay. This just kind of tells us something. Um, I've officially Rick rolled you. Um, Rick, Rick if, we, if we look at the words to the song and we count them up, we see that uh, most of the time Rick Astley would never give you up. And second to that, he would only never um, run around and desert you. Um, uh, only a very slight sliver of the time would he never let would he never let you down. Um, this is actually more related to to, uh, to our, our own work here. This is actually a, a computational project by Shahi Ilyas. Uh, Shahi uh, did a nice project in which he very simply collected all of 200 some odd flags of the world. Right? He was, you know you can just get this stuff on, online, like CIA.gov or whatever. Just get a collection of all the flags of the world. And he wrote a very simple processing program, okay, to count up the number of pixels of each color in each flag, and then represent those colors uh, as pie charts. The this is only a small section of the um, pie charts, but the countries are in alphabetical order. And if you see the, the actual project, you can sort of find your own country, right, whatever your country or the country of your ancestors might be, and you go, oh yeah, that's that's the country of my ancestors because it's got you know these you know proportions of colors. Um, you know, United States, red, white, and blue, and so forth. And in the upper right, uh, what you might expect, it's all the flags together and their relative proportions. So we see that white, then red, then, then black, and yellow are the most predominant colors of flags of the world. Um, this is sort of one of these recursive things, if you like, you know, self-reference, uh, as I do. Uh, so you can see the fraction of the image which is white and the fraction of the image which is black, not counting the area around or part there the amount of black ink per panel, and the location of black ink on this image. Um, for the purposes of our class, uh, this is my bias. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say this is what you should do, because I think you each have your own individual kind of makeup. And I asked you this question uh, on the original survey. I was like, where do you guys fall somewhere in here? I, I, uh, for this project, I, I sort of fall somewhere in here. I, I'd love to see things that are somewhere between interesting and beautiful. Um, if you guys want me something useful, though, you're not going to get your wrist flaps. That's, that's, that's okay, too. Um, but I do believe in the potential for information visualization to serve as a kind of uh, self-examination for society that allows us to see ourselves in a new way uh, and allows us to kind of go, oh, huh, I didn't know I looked like that, or I didn't know I had that back there. Okay, so that's the sort of the purpose. Can we, can we create a kind of a system where we ask a new question of the world that's never been asked, get back a kind of a raw answer, and then examine that answer from different perspectives or filter it, you know, sort it, kind of sift it, however we, until we can finally understand something about ourselves 
from this, this information you've collected, from the answer that we've gotten back from the world. Um, this is a self-portrait, and I think it's a really important one. It's a, a photograph uh, called Blind Spot by Tim Hawkinson. Um, and uh, here's a magnification of it. This is a portrait of the artist, a self-portrait, in which he has photographed all of those parts of his own body that he's not able to actually see directly with his own eyes. Now, how do you do this? Well, he has an associate or an assistant, okay? And he's looking back over his shoulder like this, and the assistant is holding a marker, like a Sharpie or something. And when, when, when the marker slips out of view, right, Tim Hawkinson says, yeah, right there. Okay, and this way, like, you, can't, you can't see your own ass, right? I mean, you can't see the top of your own head and so forth. So at this point, um, he's able to mark out and delineate the border of the part of his own body that he's not able to see. And that's the part that he has as a system photograph. And then he, just, he then stitches it together into this kind of, uh, this kind of image. Okay? So he can't see his own butt, he can't see his own, his own back, he can't see the top of his own head, and there's parts of his shoulder blades that he can't see, and everything else he can. Now, think about this for a moment as a self-portrait, because if you think about it, it, it sort of says, like, um, it's actually the part you sort of care about seeing and why you would need a self-portrait. Why would I paint a picture of myself that I can see? I, if I can already see myself, I already know that. It's already terra cognita. Right? I don't, I don't need a self-portrait of myself in the mirror. Oh, look, there I am. I already know what I look like. The per the, this, is like this is the answer to a research question. Right? What the hell do I look like in the places that I can't see? I have to build a machine, literally, invent a system is what I really mean by that, to, um, to see the parts of myself that I cannot otherwise see. This is, is, is a self-portrait that answers, that answers a question um, about basic visibility that we sort of implicitly take for granted in, take, 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 take for granted in every other self-portrait we've ever seen. Okay. Um, so there's another bit of that. Of course, you can't see his own face either. Um, here's an image. It's, uh, anyone know what this is? It's pretty straight. Yeah, right on. Yeah. Um, think about this also as the answer to a question. Um, uh, the question is, what does the Earth look like at night? It's a fairly simple question. Um, we can build a machine to answer that question for us. It's a very expensive, complicated machine, and it takes a lot of people to build it, but it's called a satellite. You launch it up. It takes a bunch of pictures. We snap them together. We stitch it together. We get this. Okay, so after building this machine to answer this question, what does the Earth look like at night, we get this, this seemingly neutral answer. And yet, it's not. It's actually a very charged answer to a seemingly new, neutral question. Because when we, when we look at this, we can, we can see things, okay? And ask questions about this image that tell us stories and tell us something about ourselves. We can see, for example, that um, you know, the developed nations, especially the United States, consume more than their fair share of the world's energy. Right? I believe the United States cons cons consumes something close to 25% of the world's energy, and that is quite clear. Africa, by contrast, literally the dark continent, right? We can also see um, this narrow line of light across um, uh, let me see that across uh, Siberia. That, those are the towns that have been erected by humans uh, 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 along the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Okay, there are lights that have no explanation out in the oceans. Those are Japanese whaling fleets. Okay, so what what we have here then is a very charged picture. We can look at this and we can now use this as an object for discussion. And as as, as yeah, Dan. I remember uh, uh, this was this picture was referenced to something I was reading about uh, the U.S. Special Operations Command, which is the special forces, and talking about you know like the Islamists in Algeria and all these things. And there's a quote from a press conference where the, the head of the, the Special Operations Command basically shows this picture and it's like, you see all the dark spots. That's where we go. Mm -hmm. The places that don't have civilization is where we end up. Well, they have civilization, all right. They just don't have electricity. Um, yeah, and, and you just can't necessarily blame people who live in those dark spots for envying the people who live in the bright spots. Um, so anyway, so so with an image like this, you, you, it's a kind of a, it's a contestational image. We can look at it, we can talk about what it means, and we can argue about what it means. We can tell stories about what it means, and we can we can think about um, the challenging kinds of of content that are laid in, in this here. So just making a machine to answer this simple, seemingly simple question. What does the work of Earth look like at night? Produces this kind of interesting artifact. Um, this is probably not more, 
no more more glaring than in, in an image of uh, the two Koreas, Pyongyang being the dot you know, in the center over there. You can't get my cursor. There, there's Pyongyang. Um, I, I don't often show my own work, but I'm going to show uh, my own work for a second. Um, a project I did called The Secret Lives of Numbers, which I feel uh, maybe gets at the kind of process I want to sort of uh, propose to you guys. A number of years ago, I went to a, a web browser and I typed in, I was very bored, I was just typing in search terms. I was typing in things like Michael Jackson, you know, and see how, how popular they are. So you, you get this little number in the upper right, right, 84 million. And uh, it's kind of funny that that's the only feedback we still have about um, how popular is the search term that we're looking for. But that number is very important. How many of you guys look at that number when, when you're doing your searches? Yeah, it, reading that number is actually itself a kind of literacy. Um, and it's kind of peculiar that that's the only feedback we have about how popular our search terms. But we use that to understand whether our search was too specific and produced almost no results, or whether our search was too general and produced too many results. We also use it to, to gauge, I, I've even used it to gauge the proper spelling of a word. How many of you have done that? Right? You, have, you have two different variants of the spelling of a word, and you're like, I don't know which is correct. Turns out maybe both are correct, but one of them has four times as many hits as the other. So you say, okay, I'll go with that one. It's a weird way of going about it, but you can do that, right? Um, and of course, you can also use it to say, like, who's more famous, you know, me or Michael Jackson? And you know, the answer is obviously Michael Jackson. And so, so this number is our feedback to that. But we can also look at that number for all kinds of strange things. In this case, I typed in the number 910, just out of a hat, 910, and we see 84 million hits. If we type in 912. Uh, we get 69 million hits. But if we type in the number 911, something happens, we have more hits, 109 million hits when I took this screenshot. So somehow, 911, okay, somehow more popular in the collective unconscious, right? It, it, somehow more, it figures more into, our, uh, into our, our culture. And why should it be? Well, lots of reasons, and I think you, you can imagine what they are. So um, I did a project in which I wrote a simple script to scrape the popularity of every number from one to a million, and then I plotted them. On, on this plot you, should, you see here, and I built an interactive application, which is on the web, rather than Java, uh, called the Secret Lives of Numbers, to show this. And you can see right there, I have two different displays. One is a kind of classic histogram chart, and the other is a, this kind of weird um, scatter, uh, scatter matrix thing. Uh, not actually scatter matrix, excuse me, just, just a matrix, um, in which the, on the right-hand side, numbers are arranged from 0 to 99, 100 to 199, in rows of 100. Okay? And um, so a few things. First, you can see that there are uh, regular patterns. There are spikes, as you can plainly see in the histogram, every 10, right? 9, 9, 920, 930, 940, 950 is a big spike, 900 is a bigger spike even. There's spikes every 100, there's spikes every 1,000. Um, there's also uh, other kinds of patterns that emerge. If you look on the, the right-hand side, uh, the vertical stripes, those are, the, these here are, um, these are the 10, right? These are numbers like, uh, numbers that end in 0, that end in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so forth. Um, the first big block of numbers ending here, this shows the, 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 uh, all the numbers up to 10,000, because 100 by 100, right? So this is basically up to here, those are the four-digit numbers. So four-digit numbers as a whole are more popular than, than five-digit numbers, okay? We just use them more in our lives. And we can, we can begin to see uh, other patterns as well. Um, uh, first of all, individual numbers, like the low numbers, uh, are, are more popular. So are that bright band of numbers right there, um, about uh, 2,000 down, those are the years, for instance, the common era, right, 1990 to 2000 and so forth, are really bright. Uh, and an interesting stripe of diagonal. So just to give you an interesting, you see this diagonal here? Those are four digit numbers that rhyme. Those are, those are numbers like 55, 55, or, or 43, 43, or 57, 57, 62, 62. And they're more popular, I submit to you, simply because they're easier to remember. Uh, you, if you have a pizza place or a taxi company, you want those in your phone number, right? Because then it's just easier to remember uh, a taxi company or a pizza place with a number like that. Um, so, and then you, there are individual bright spots as well. Uh, one that I like a lot, this one here number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Again, popular simply because it, it's easier to remember. 
So what we see here is a kind of a, a numeric snapshot from the collective unconscious in which all the numbers of our daily life, the tax code forms like 1040, the years like 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and 1776, 1945 are more prominent, right? The zip codes and telephone numbers and, and other kinds of area codes that are more prominent are visualized here. The television shows like 90210 are more popular here. The, the, the processors, the 8086s 80, and the 8386, 8486s, those are all manifest here. So by asking this kind of strange question of the world and creating a machine to produce the data for me and then producing another machine to visualize it, I'm able to produce a kind of an artifact that allows for some argument and for some investigation. All right, we can look at this and we can sort of say, well, why is that more popular? Oh, that's a, those are the Paris zip codes. I didn't know the Paris zip codes start with 75,000, but they do, right? Um, and we can, we can begin to understand something more about, about ourselves compiled from, from trillions of pieces of data, but somehow distilling it down like this shows us new things we might not have other seen, otherwise seen. There are many different ways of visualizing data. This is from uh, Ben Fry, uh, from his thesis, and he just shows, in this case, 25 different ways, but there's many, many others. Um, and uh, I'll talk about them more, I think, in detail on Wednesday when we get to talk about how we do this stuff. But um, some of these are familiar to you because you use them every day and you look at the New York Times, and some of them may be unfamiliar to you because they don't come up too often. But each of them represents its own kind of literacy. And fortunately for you as designers and artists, we've never had greater visual, visual literacy for this kind of, of, of way of talking about things than ever before. And there's such a kind of curiosity uh, about this that you know, the New York Times, for example, under the directorship of Amanda Cox, is taking tremendous sort of risks and, and, and strides to, um, to just try out new ways of visualizing things, uh, but also to depend on these sort of tried and true favorites because um, it, it turns out people are much more literate than we thought. Um, here's another one, chart suggestions, a thought starter. Um, this is a, uh, online, you can find this if you look for chart suggestions, and I'll, I'll post a link to this as well. But you think to yourself, what would you like to show? A comparison, a composition, a relationship, and from here you can, you can find uh, you know, some different ways of doing it. You know, if you want a formula or, or a kind of a uh, thought starter for, for your visualization, what are some ways of dealing with different kinds of data? You don't have to invent a new way of visualizing something every time. In fact, using familiar uh, visual language can be just fine. I'm not even going to get to talk about today uh, things like information sonification uh, or physical information visualization, although we might need someone to show the, uh, the butt plugs. Are you familiar with the butt plugs? Anyone familiar with the butt plug? Just, just Rob. Oh, uh, uh, Marlena as well. Um, <laughs> good. What's that? Oh, I showed them in class. Okay. What's that? The same ones from last time. The same butt, yeah, the same butt plugs from the last time. They've been watching. I'm actually talking about the uh, presidential. The presidential butt plugs. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, so there's, there's also, there's a huge, there's a, there's a huge. People are like, what presidential butt plug? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's kind of a burgeoning uh, new field of physical information visualization, which you really could think of as more like sculptural information visualization, in which people are using uh, rapid prototyping and digital fabrication techniques in order to show data in the physical world in three-dimensional forms and so forth, uh, sometimes kinetic forms as well. So today I want to begin with um, some different kinds of approaches to data, uh, and I want to talk about artists' approaches in particular, and not even worry so much about code to start with, although a couple of the examples I've thrown in here are code-based. Um, let's talk about collections. Um, here are some things that collectors have collected. On, on the right-hand side, uh, wanted, unusual egg beaters. Who is this person? Well, they like egg beaters, we know that. Uh, on the left-hand side, this guy likes lightning rod balls. Okay. You know, T Tony Catalano in Ohio collects lightning rod balls. Nothing is more amazing than the simple truth. Nothing is more exotic than our own surroundings. Nothing is more fantastic in effect than objective description. And nothing is more remarkable than the time in which we live. If you collect enough of something, you can begin to make comparisons between them and discover kind of the wonderful variety that's there that maybe you had ignored previously. That's what collections do. Collections are, are as old as, as, um, as any kind of thing. Uh, starting in the 1600s or 1500s, people started to make these things called wonder commerce, which were rooms that would compile crazy stuff that people had found um, you know, on, 
that traveled out in the world. Is everything right there, Dan? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, people would, would come back from, from trips with things like fossils or weird shells or mutant baby, you know, heads and things like that. And they would come up with, and they'd just stick, stick you in a room and they look at this amazing thing. It's a, it's a rhinoceros. It's a, you know, in Europe, they'd never seen a rhinoceros before. And they would, they would make these rooms full of amazing and wonderful things that they could not have imagined. Um, with the birth of photography in the 1830s, people started to photograph these collections because it seemed like that's what you should use photography for. Photography provides a good vantage point from which to observe people engaged in the act of observing the world and collecting phenomena. In uh, William Henry Fox Talbot's The Library, 1845, one of the very first photographs, really, and on the right-hand side, uh, 1839, the uh, Daguerre, the original Daguerre of Daguerre-type fame, uh, shells and fossils, we see illustrated the curatorial nature of photography, a medium concerned to a large degree with preserving the presence, no matter how ordinary, and cataloging phenomena. Oh, that's right there. Yeah. Okay. You got that, Dan? So the series, I know a lot of people wearing jackets, it must be too cold. Oh, the window is open. Yeah. And the vents are covered. Okay. The series, the photographic series, is a backbone of photosensibility. And like the collection, it implies a belief in scientific method. One example, one photograph of something weird and remarkable is not sufficiently evidential, because one might simply be a coincidence. But many repeatedly are compelling. They become proof. This is from Richard Roth. Um, and people collect all kinds of things. There's vernacular connoisseurship, right? People collect pictures. People collect license plates. How many of you guys have collections or had collections? What do you guys collect? Front line. Hats. Hats. What else? Um, uh, books about words. Books about words. What else? Rocks. Rocks. Geology, huh? Me too. Uh, what are and Glass bottles. Me too. Did you get old ones? Not really. Oh, okay. Uh, and state quarters. State quarters. You get all fifty? I think I did, yeah. And then you spent them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. There's another national park quarter. Oh. All right. Um, uh, here are flea market beer steins, just because. Um, Richard Simmons, if you know who he is, has about fifteen hundred pictures of Barbara Streisand. Okay. Um, Mr. John L. Kreit is a curator of parasitic worms. That's the sign on his door. Imagine his collection. Um, so I want to talk about artist collections uh, in terms of their formal play, their social research, and their critical inquiry. Um, Klaus Oldenburg made a, a kind of a uh, rack of ray guns, 1972. Uh, the ray gun wing housed a collection of ray guns as well as objects in the shape of a ray gun, including even rusty scraps of metal having silhouettes vaguely resembling a ray gun. Um, like other early class Oldenburgs, these collections problematize the relationship between the museum and the store. Right? Is this is this a store where you can buy a ray gun, or is this a museum where he's shown a, his collection of ray guns? Um, the store is the evil twin of the museum. Uh, thrift store paintings is a project by Jim Shaw. Uh, it's a it's an ex traveling exhibition of 185 anonymous amateur paintings that he purchased at thrift stores. Uh, it was one of the most powerful exhibitions of the 1990s. These paintings were funny and frightening, and reminding us to pay attention to the quiet teenage boy next door who paints bucks and women in flaming eyeballs. The title of the painting shown here is Woman in Underwear Smiled at Photo by Pink Couch. Okay, so um, a, a collection of, of thrift store paintings that kind of are remarkable and awful. Portia Munson, The Pink Project, very interesting project. Uh, all the pro products you see here are products for adult women. Um, that she has collected and compiled and put into a variety of different arrangements. Sometimes uh, she arranges them all in just a big heap. Other times she arranges them neatly on a table. Um, but these are uh, these kinds of um, objects of everyday life for intended for adult women that shows the extent to which uh, product manufacturers are kind of infantilizing uh, the women who purchase them. Uh, even you know laundry detergent, you can see those bottles and you know, stuff in there. Okay. Um, so there's a strategy called small multiples. Are, are, are any of you familiar with the term from Edward Tufte? Okay. Uh, somewhere back here, we've got the four Tufte books, and I can't recommend them highly enough. You should all have a look. Um, the idea of small multiples is to show a uniform presentation of similar things 
which allows for comparison between the UN units and also an understanding of the category as a whole. Usually it's gridded, but not necessarily. This is a nice project in 2007 called What's 200 Calories Look Like? It's actually a really nice student project. Students say, what's 200 calories look like? Again, right? Come up with a good question. What's the 200 calories look like? Develop a machine or a system to answer the question. In this case, you know, uh, a trip to the supermarket and a little bit of research and a camera and arrange them in a grid, right? And you, you can see it's, uh, 200 calories can be a, a huge bunch of celery or it can be a pat of butter or it can be, uh, what is that, you know, seven Hershey kisses or something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Hershey kisses or something like that. Or uh, with a Vienna finger. All right. So that, that's what 200 calories looks like. And, you know, by presenting, the, the important thing is by presenting it in a strategy where you sort of, you hold one thing constant and you hold that rule absolutely firm, right? Then everything else just falls into place. The piece writes itself, right? The piece just takes care of itself. You just, you just, you, you plop them into a grid and you sort them by, let's say, by size. Collections are rarely disordered. And this goes back to this notion of sorting, in this case, by size or something else. Usually some form of organizational principle is applied, such as sorting by some variable, weight or size, spatializing according to an underlying map, or some other logic, perhaps metaphoric or cinematic. Uh, this is a project that was a completely analog project made by um, uh, a student of mine from several years ago. And she went to uh, the large cemetery out by Frick Park, and she collected photographs of certainly not all, but about 100 or 200 um, gravestones. And she sorted them on the bottom axis by when they were born, and on the top axis, it's not labeled, unfortunately, uh, by when they died. So basically just plotting birth dates against death dates, and then plopping the, the, uh, the, the, the photograph, in a very high resolution image, plopping the photograph of the gravestone there. What became interesting was you could see, um, I might have the axes reversed, you could see parts where uh, there were large, significant deaths all at the same time. I think, I think this column here might, might have been World War II, right? Like all, all these people were, were dying at most of the same time. Um, and you could also see visual trends in literally in the design of gravestones, because mostly from bottom left to upper right, uh, they are they're organized in terms of age. Um, also, you could see depending on whether they whether someone fell on the, the top or the bottom side of the diagonal, you'd see people who were long-lived or short-lived. Um, so small multiples, this is scanned out of Edward Tufte's book, and, and if you don't know his books, we'll, we'll bring them out so you guys can make sure you see them. Uh, so the idea of the small multiple um, is to show as much data as possible just by comparing these different elements. Uh, in this splendid drawing uh, from 1659, uh, the inner ellipse traces Earth's yearly journey around the sun, the larger ellipse shows Saturn's orbit, uh, viewed from the heavens. The outermost images depict Saturn as seen through telescopes located on Earth. All told, we have 32 Saturns at different locations in, in three dimensions and from the perspective of two different observers. Uh, a very good small multiple design. Another one, um, this is uh, a, an old method of, of doing finger mathematics, right? Just presented together like this in, in, in finger math. Small multiples can consist of other information graphics, such as time series and histograms. We can look at um, uh, average costs of repair for, for different years of, of clutches on Fords um, and so forth. So these are the small multiple of, of histograms. Um, here's uh, a collection, in this case, of um, this is uh, Google Zeitgeist for six different topics for 2003. Okay, so we, here what we're doing is we're comparing, right, these three, uh, six different timelines for six different topics um, in terms of uh, matrix reloaded and the way that it, it spiked uh, later in the year, in May, let's say, whereas Iraq in 2003 spiked it at, in March, uh, which is when Operation Iraqi Freedom began. Okay. So we can sort of see how these things fall against each other. Collections of maps and maps of collections. Kim Dingle is an artist who went out to um, the Las Vegas high school and she asked a group of teenagers there if they would each draw the United States on a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper. Um, she then collected the drawings of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper with the United States drawing on it. And um, she simply transferred uh, and copied those drawings at one-to-one -one scale onto this kind of big board. So this is just a, a compilation she's made at one-to-one -one scale. So what do we see here in the, in the ways that these Las Vegas teenagers understand 
the shape of the United States. We see a number of different, different things. We see, um, first of all, how, how puzzlingly bad some of their knowledge of the United States geography is. For example, How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks like Nevada. Like, like what? Nevada. Nevada. They, they, they may have just the question. They have Florida. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe they maybe they played Nevada and United States in their own mind. Uh, I like this one. Uh, here. Actually, we can understand the kind of the ur shape, the, the, the mental shape in our mind, the gestalt, if you will, of the of the shape of the United States. If we sort of average these all together, we, we basically can reckon that the parts of the United States shape that stick out in our minds are literally, well, there's a kind of a Florida down to the lower right, and there's a kind of a Maine in the upper upper right, and there's a, a Texas somewhere in the middle and the bottom, and then there's sometimes uh, a lake. Um, so we, we begin to sort of understand how we uh, ourselves understand or encode in our brain the shape of the United States. Um, this is as much a visualization of um, the, the, the sort of the memorability of the shape of the United States as it is kind of a picture of these specific Las Vegas teenagers. And with each of these, we can associate an individual person with them, right? And, and talk about their geographic knowledge. Look at look at this one here. It's kind of a mapping, doesn't it? Right? It's got that track of boundary. Um, Megan Campbell did a project called The Subway Line. This is both in intensely subjective and intensely documentary, right? Uh, she rode the subway, uh, different subways in fact, um, from, in, this, in the first case, uh, it's the one train from 96th Street to 103rd Street, and uh, in the second place, it's the G train from Bergen to Carroll. Uh, what was she doing here? She was attempting to draw a straight line in her sketchbook while riding these trains, okay? So is this, the question is, is this, is this purely subjective? Well, yes and no. I mean, obviously, it encodes a, a specific experience of one person writing one line in her sketchbook. But actually, it, it's also something intensely intersubjective. Everyone experienced this road, this ride, right, on, on the 7 train. It was like that for everyone to some certain extent. And this is, this is real empirical data. It's not a very big collection of data, but it's real empirical data. The point is, by comparing them in a sort of small multiple format, we can actually talk about you know, the one train versus the seven train. OK. Um, this is, uh, oh, shoot. I just remember, I just flipped out of my, my mind the name of a guy. Oh, Dennis Wood. Um, so Dennis Wood uh, is a cartography professor um, in the South. And he had his students map out uh, jack-o'-lanterns. This is the Boylan Heights pumpkin map. So Boylan Heights is a neighborhood uh, near in the university town where, where Dennis Wood teaches. And what we see here is basically he said, OK, students, you're going to fan out. You're going to cover Boylan Heights. You're going to use the map. Okay? You're going to take a photograph of every jack-o'-lantern that you see on uh, Halloween. Okay? And we're going to take that photograph. And we're not just going to position that photograph. Let's say we're not just going to sort them in a grid. We're not just going to sort them from brightest to darkest. We're actually going to put them on the map in the place where they're from. So this particular jack o' lantern here, right, was from that particular location. So here's a question for you: Where are all the kids living? On the north side of town or the south side of town? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, for example, everyday objects reveal rich, though qualitative, information about their owners. And sort of in the same way that we can know something about the individual teenagers in Kim Dingle's United States of America, um, this is a project by, by um, Stacy Green called Listix, uh, in which she co collected uh, listics that were innocently and, and uh, kind of inadvertently shaped in various ways by their owners. Um, this project is from the early 90s. Uh, she noticed one day that her friend had a remarkably shaped lipstick, and she then started to ask more women and uh, other friends of hers to, to, if she could look at their lipsticks, and she discovered this. So what kinds of things do we see going on here? Anyone want to make any observations? Some fight. 
What's that? Some bite. Some bite. Yeah. Well, well, what we see here, anyone else? Um, I'll, I'll tell you several things I see. I see, first of all, um, obviously, you know, color is, is a factor. Every woman has her own complexion, right? So there's something in, in, about the ways in which, um, you know, a, a color that works for one person may not work for another. Um, we see, most remarkably, some incredible variations in shape. And we realize that these are actually sculpted through a repetitive, uh, self-similar process, sort of, you know, constantly iterative process of sculpture, if you will, encoding a repeated gesture in space that, if you think about it, is highly multidimensional. Let's, let's say six degrees of freedom, right? There's rotations, there's three rotations and then, and then a three-dimensional position in space that encode uh, the position of lipstick over time. So each individual person has a kind of a gesture that has produced this, and that gesture is absolutely unique. Do we know something unique about, do we know something about Ellen uh, from her lipstick? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, we certainly know that, that there's a kind of a, a pathway through space that she's moved her lips again. We know something about her complexion. We even know something a little bit about the fastidiousness of these women based on the, whether these are neat or, or messy. Um, these are, of course, proxies for people. Um, people are much more richly multidimensional than these lipsticks are, but there's an interesting way in which these can stand in for people even though they represent this tremendous reduction in data. They encode something about their owners, uh, how they, their, their complexion, how they move through space, how they maintain this little micro-sculpture, um, and other features as well. This is a project by Melissa Clarkson, a student of mine, unfortunately it's quite shrunk down. Syringe needles classified by purpose and size. Uh, she collected every needle and, uh, that you could get and just stacked them up. There was nothing like this in any of the literature. You couldn't actually just see a comparison of needles. Uh, the, the big one, um, hard to read, I'm sorry. Amniocentesis, six inches long, uh, spinal tap about uh, three and a half inches long, and so forth. So you can actually see like how long is the needle they use for amniocentesis? Six inches. And they were all just kind of stacked up in relative exact proportions and, and pr presented it as kind of as an information chart um, to, see, to be able to compare them better. George Grady has a project called Pocket Full of Memories. It's kind of a kiosk that records the contents of your pockets. You go up to this kind of camera system, you dump out all the crap in your pocket, and then uh, you add some tags to it. And as a result of this, you're able to, you're sort of able to database, like show me all the keys, show me all the wallets, show me all the watches, show me all the um, coins. Uh, and you begin to understand people's vernacular organization systems for the stuff that they carry. And you realize that everyone, when they're a nomad in everyday life, uh, temporarily, um, you know, has these various kinds of organizational strategies for, for, for the things that they carry, why they carry them. How many of you are familiar with this project by Aaron Coburn? It's a good one. If you're not familiar with it, bears, bears explanation. Um, he used something called Mechanical Turk. I highly recommend Mechanical Turk, and I actually hope one of you uses one or more of you use it for your project. It's a great, it's a great way of working. Mechanical Turk is a service where you can pay people very small amounts of money to do very small jobs. Okay, uh, those people are mostly in uh, India and uh, China, but also actually all around the world. Um, if you're a completely broke student, you can make uh, something approximating minimum wage just by sitting at your computer um, doing these kinds of jobs. What do people normally use Mechanical Turk for back up? Because this, this is not the kind of normal purpose of Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk is uh, a way of automating human intelligence to have it work in concert with computer artificial intelligence. Imagine a problem like the following. Suppose you're a computer vision researcher and you've got a database of, of 10,000 images. And some of them have cars and some of them don't have cars. And you want to train a classifier to know whether an image has a car or not. Okay? To do that, you need ground truth. You need to know whether an image actually does, in fact, have a car in it or not. Only then could you actually train a classifier because you need to give the classifier actual factual information. This means that you need 10,000 images labeled as to whether or not they contain a car. Now, 10,000 images, hmm, that's a lot kind of a lot to do yourself, but even a lot to give your students. Um, you'd rather your students were writing the open, you know, the open CD code to figure it out or training the classifier. Um, what do you do? Enter Mechanical Turk. A Mechanical Turk, you can propose micro jobs to people. They're called HITs or Human Intelligence Tasks, where you can basically provide a machine where, where, where people can annotate those images for you. 
And for small amounts of money, like two cents per, per, per image, people will, will say there is a car or there isn't in a given image, for example. Now, people use mechanical search for all kinds of other things. People have, uh, people write uh, movie reviews, or you know, that's how movie reviews get populated on, on, on Netflix, uh, things like that. <clears throat> people use it to um, review comments and eliminate spam. People use it to do all kinds of things, to, for example, uh, some kinds of, some, often some, some, some strange requests, like uh, take photographs of every house in a neighborhood, you know, things like that. Um, and you can do these yourself. The, t the tasks generally range, uh, you know, from about one or two cents per task to sometimes a couple of dollars per task. Um, and you can you can you can command more money, or you can pay more money for people who can actually write English, you know, well, um, you know, uh, things like that. So it's a it's a way of of, of automating it. Uh, more recently, how many of you are familiar with a project at MIT called Soylent? Oh, it's a great project. Soylent uh, refers to the movie Soylent Green. The, the tagline is "It's People," um, and the way uh, the way Soylent works is that you're, it's a word processor where you're just typing your um, your term paper or whatever it might be. But secretly, well, not secretly to you, but sort of in the background, there are mechanical turkers who are looking at what you're typing and making corrections as you go. Okay, these are mechanical turkers who are particularly good at, at, at uh, um, reading and writing English. Okay, and they're basically proofreading as you go. So it's, it's kind of like having this kind of like crowd of, of, of human editors who are fixing your, your language as you type. And the person who developed it, uh, now a professor at Stanford, um, it was his PhD thesis, developed it in order to, um, to figure out ways of how, how do you, you know, create these kinds of collaborative systems where I have machines that have somehow hum, hum, uncanny intelligence embedded in them, right? Reminding to show you also besides the butt plugs another another ITP project the, uh, the the descriptive camera that's one I'll I'll get to as well okay so what did Aaron Copeland do this project is now quite a number of years old at least five years old if not more maybe six um, 2006 makes it seven years old um, Aaron paid workers on Mechanical Turk two cents a piece to draw a sheep facing to the left. The request comes uh, with inspiration from uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry's Little Prince book, if you know it. Um, so he said, uh, please draw me a sheep. And people would get paid two pennies, two cents, to draw a sheep. Uh, and he built a special processing program, a special processing application, to record their drawings. It was a very simple kind of Java-based, you know, record their drawings, give them a grayscale color palette so they could choose color and have them draw a sheep. And some people would do seemingly more labor than you might think two pennies is worth, right? And you look at that sheet kind of in the center at the top, it's beautiful, that's a gorgeous sheet, right? Someone probably spent more than two cents worth of time doing that. But that's because, you know, doing so was of interest to them. It relieved the team of, the, the team of their day. In so doing, he collected, just by spending $200, um, uh, 10,000 sheets facing to the left. So with 10,000 sheets, he was able to sort them in various ways. And he just presents them as a collection. But uh, a collection that's, that's kind of, um, that could, could not have been made in any other way, except, except with kind of a machine to automate the process of collecting this data. With them, we, we understand something about sheets, and we just also understand something about the, the new nature of, of the crowd that we're constantly connected to. I have, um, we taught information visualization workshops at other schools often over the course of just a few days and I've had students with very, very noob programming skills do fantastic me um, Mechanical Turk projects. I'm glad to show you some. Um, Mechanical Turk is really easy to use and it's a great way of, of, of getting a lot of data fast. I'll show a few, I'll show a few projects that way. Um, this is a book called Head by Alex Kaiser. It's pictures of, of bald people. Um, it's, it's fascinating how um, to get how, how similar and yet how different they are. So again, by holding fast to a rule. If I had to say one kind of critique of, of students, it's, 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 um, it's often that uh, it's really hard to hold fast to a rule, but it's really worth it. If you can, if you can manage to, to apply the rigor of really obeying the rule, you can get some great results. This is um, a set of four, a small multiple by Yoga Ono. It's a flux of stone from the mid-60s called Bottoms. Um, it, it's just four, the asses of four people in a short film. Um, uh, what's interesting is the way that it kind of oscillates back and forth between this kind of 
kind of weirdly erotic, you know, set of asses with just kind of totally abstract sets of sort of four squares. You know? um, creating a collection can sometimes be accomplished through a process of removal or filtering rather than accumulation. Um, another piece by Tim Hawkinson, who did the inverse self-portrait you saw earlier. Uh, this is a bleached football game. Um, it's an altered found photograph out of a magazine in which he used bleach to remove everything but the, the, the numbers on the jerseys of the football players. Right, it's a photograph of a guy playing football, but he's taken out everything except the numbers. This is by um, Rutherford Chang. And it is uh, the front page of the New York Times, in which he has obliterated with a black marker everything except the faces. He then presents these in a calendar showing an entire month of such front pages of the New York Times. Okay? And as you can tell, this is from the, the month when Ray Charles passed away. Um, I believe Ronald Reagan passed away in the same month, just a few days before. So you can see on the, on the upper left, there's Ronald Reagan and there's Ray Charles. So it's a way of taking this incredibly complicated data artifact, the front page of the New York Times, and by filtering out everything except the faces, we end up with this artifact showing um, who mattered in the news, right, that month. And it's tremendously people-centric. And it also becomes something that, um, uh, that anyone can read, literally, even if you don't actually read, or if you don't actually read English. Um, it's a great project. Uh, this is by Kathy Prendergast. It's called Lost. And it's an actual map of the United States. Uh, it is a map showing um, only those places whose names contain the word lost. Okay, So it turns out that there really are places in the United States called, for example, Lost Creek, Lost Island, Lost Mountain, Lost Lagoon, Lost Canyon. Um, and she's shown only those places. And by filtering out everything except those places, in a certain way, she's found them. Right? She found the Lost Canyon. She found the Lost Lagoon. Um, at first glance, Kathy Prendergast's map of the United States appears straightforward, providing topographical information about mountain ranges, lakes, and state borders. Closer inspection reveals that only the places located on the map are named, that the only, the only places located on this map are the ones named Lost. Do these Lost Creeks, Lost Islands, Lost Mountains, Lost Lagoons, and Lost Canyons describe the actual places and their hidden positions, or do they report on a particular waste resource? Or do they describe the mental states, the early settlers who named them, or perhaps the eventual state of the native peoples and their traditions? The ambiguity evoked in these actual place names mirrors a feeling of possibility and a land of uncertainty lost. Oh, sorry, land of uncertainty. Lost 1999 provides a poetically ambivalent reminiscence of American history. Um, so, again, an interesting, interesting approach. Just take an artifact you already have, the freaking map, okay, and remove everything except one thing. And if you do it rigorously enough, you end up with a fairly interesting artifact. Sometimes new ways of understanding a collection can be achieved simply through rearrangement of an existing set. This could mean sorting or grouping it in an unexpected way. Um, this is again from Tim Hawkinson. The alphabet alphabetized. The letters of the alphabet arranged in alphabetical order according to their phonetic zone. Think about it. Um, this is one of my favorite projects. It's by Evan Roth, co-founder of the Fat Lab, one of the, my graffiti crew. Um, and he did this project uh, called Sky Mall Liberation. This is a data visualization made completely, not, it, it made completely with analog materials. He didn't even have a fucking pair of scissors um, because he was on an airplane when he made it. Um, he ripped out all the faces from a, a Sky Mall and simply rearranged them. On the right, males. On the left, excuse me, on the, on the left male, on the right female, right? And just by rearranging the contents of sky Mall, we, we can begin to see the kinds of patterns about who it's being, who, who are things being marketed to and how. Non-white, white. white. Um, Fred Wilson is an artist who exposes the ideological agenda and exclusionary practices of cultural institutions he has a, a, a long, ongoing project called Mining the Museum, in which he rearranges artifacts uh, at the Museum of Invitation from their own collections. Um, so here we see a collection of metal artifacts from uh, the 1780s 
from Baltimore. All right, so what do we got here? What's that? What's that? Yeah. So um, these are metal artifacts from actually from the same neighborhood from the same time. These are literally, if you were, if you were on a plantation in Baltimore in the 1780s, you would, you would see slave shackles and you would see these kinds of, uh, uh, you know, silver repoussé style um, canteens and steins and so forth. Um, but by simply imposing the rule, let me see metal objects from the 1780s from this location in Baltimore, you end up with this juxtaposition that you would not ordinarily see as a way of thinking about, you know, how to organize a museum collection, right? But by, but by putting them together, we begin to have a, a better picture of what um, life might have been like in the 1780s in a Baltimore plantation. Uh, by juxtaposing iron slave shackles found in the archives of the historical society with silver vessels in Baltimore Repose style, he re reinvigorates both the role of the museum and the discourse of history. The photo series is the backbone of a photographic collection and implies a belief in scientific method. One example is not sufficiently evidential, but many are compelling. Oh, we were here. Um, here's Oliver Eliasson's The Fault series. These are, these are literally photographs of faults collected by Oliver Eliasson. Um, how many of you are familiar with Baird and Hilla Becker? German photography couple. Uh, they've been working since the 50s or 60s, collecting um, photographs of like objects. These are gas tanks in Germany. Obviously different ones, and yet oddly similar. Here are these kinds of uh, mills. Here are other kinds of grain silos. Water towers. Farmhouses. You see the patterns, you also see the individuals. Um, water towers, 1980s. Uh, black and white photographs. Um, this is by Bill Sullivan, uh, totally illegal. Uh, he's set himself up opposite the turnstile, and these people catch it, are, are only are only sort of caught by it when they, when, you know, they, they kind of achieve awareness of the fact that they're being captured, only at the very moment that they're being captured. He's done lots and lots of these, they're pretty amazing looking. Um, every person being framed by this, this kind of same situation and it's a capture of a very specific moment. Everyone framed identically. Again, the, the actual machinery Bill Swisher has in the camera, but if you think about it more conceptually, he's built a machine in terms of a system, a capture system, for creating this kind of condition, right? He's got a set of rules, which you guys could, could, could articulate if, you, if I asked you to, right? about how he goes about doing this, and it produces a, a pretty remarkable artifact. Collections of new media, getting closer to where we're, where we're working. Uh, Jennifer and Kevin McCoy have been really at the forefront of this. Um, there's a website, this is not by them, called Backstage Pass, in which uh, for your favorite band, whatever that band might be, you can get to see the, uh, the band rider of that band. Now a band rider is a list of shit that the band wants when they're on tour, okay? Uh, and here are a couple different um, band riders. Uh, here's, here's a band rider for um, smoke, uh, Guns N' Roses. Okay? So uh, it's actually it's a two-page rider, or well, probably more. It says, you know, they want like, you know, catering and they want, you know, a case of Budweiser and so forth. Um, they want <laughs> an assortment of adult magazines. Uh, and then this, this here is, is where you really get to understand the character of your favorite band. Um, they want uh, fresh Wonder Bread and also uh, a bottle of Dom Perignon. Right? This lovely contrast between like the most banal and the kind of the fanciest, right? The kind of kind of thing that's going on there. So Jennifer and Kevin McCoy created the Band Rider series, and their exhibition consists of at, uh, when they're invited to do this by a museum, okay, or a gallery, uh, they say, "Great, here are the three the three Band Riders. In this case, uh, Nine Inch Nails, Jennifer Lopez, and Guns N' Roses." And the, basically, the, the the way that it's exhibited is just in a vitrine. Uh, in which all the shit requested by Nine Inch Nails, Jennifer Lopez, and Gun Rose are respectively presented in turn in a series of small multiples, right? And so you can begin to understand the individual character of these bands. For example, Nine Inch Nails, it's like cigarettes and a carrot juicer. You know, it's kind of, it's, um, uh, you know, Jennifer Lopez wants flowers. Um, 
uh, on the right, Guns N' Roses with their Wonder Bread and Dumb Perignon. Uh, you, you, you know, everything you might understand about these bands in terms of them being the cultural, uh, these, these distillations of sort of cultural meme sets are kind of likewise encoded in the, in the crap that they want behind, behind stage as well as in front, as front stage. It connects the, the identity of the band that you know from in front of the stage with the identity of the band in back of the stage. Okay? And it's actually it's a really lightweight piece for, for uh, Jennifer and Kevin McCoy uh, to present because they just literally they give, they give the gallery the shopping list and um, then they just arrive, it's all there, they just arrange it. Lazy like a fox. Um, another project of theirs, which actually is not Lazy Like a Fox at all, um, <clears throat> is um, Every Shot. And they've done this with a few different series. Uh, in this case, they've taken the 1970s cop buddy television show called Starsky and Hutch. And they've cut it up into every shot, and they've databased this set of shots, okay, according to content, and then arranged all of these individual DVDs, okay, by topic. So, there's every stairway. There's an entire DVD of every stairway from Starsky and Hutch, or every female cop, or every person giving technical advice, or every arriving on the scene. Okay? So they've gone through and they've annotated this stuff and they've databased everything and then just said, and then just say, okay, now that I've databased every single shot of the entire television series for all of its episodes and seasons of Starsky and Hutch, okay, now I can just issue a, a freaking query. Right? and then dump that to a DVD, showing every disguise, every shop owner, every establishing shop, every ordering of food, every comic criminal. Oops. Uh, they've done this also for um, Looney Tunes series. They took, the, they took the collective Looney Tunes. You probably know these better. Um, every hanging by a thread, every speed cloud, every running really fast, every jet pack and rocket. So, you know, Wile E. Coyote and so forth. Right? Yeah. Every, uh, they have every fall from a great height. They have the one, the, one of the discs is, you know, every time that someone smacks into a wall and when there's a, a tunnel painted there. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, every singed fur or hair. Uh, and this is their database system for every anvil. Every anvil, of course, is named that piece where you know they have like the anvil that falls on someone, right? So every anvil, and then they, they just have you know they, for, their, for every every shot they, they indicate these. This is their, their their databasing system. They use this, I think, this FileMaker Pro uh, to do it. And then they, they just have some very simple some very simple scripts to query and then compile the videos onto those DVDs. Right? Kind of combination of laborious hand annotation, and then. Uh, some some automatic and some hand segmentation, and then automatic compilation. A compilation simply is a query into the database. Uh, a project of mine, um, I won't think too much about it, but I, I collected, uh, well actually, well, here, here's, here's um, maybe what I want to point out about this piece. Uh, a friend of mine was working, nowadays he works at Google, he's one of the Google Pittsburgh people, uh, but at the time, he was uh, working for a company doing, doing automated text analysis, primarily for, gov for government uh, uh, agencies. Okay, and I, I, he's a good friend of mine. He's my roommate from college, and um, <clears throat> he's here in Pittsburgh. His name is Kamal, and um, Kamal was doing some work where he was. They were analyzing. This is 2005. They were analyzing all of Usenet, and they were analyzing all of um, all the blogs. Right. And he had his company at the time. He had machines that were scraping all of the blogs, looking for terrorism because that's what the government's interested in. And um, so, you know, he had other databases too. The CIA has all of your email, just so you know. Um, and uh, um, so he had all the blogs, and he said, you know, we're, we're not really finding. <laughs> I was like, are you finding terrorists on all the blogs, on Blogger, and, and stuff like that? And he's like, no, no, we're not, we're not really finding any terrorists on the blogs. And I was like, well, what are you finding? <clears throat> and he said, actually, it's a lot of teenage angst. <laughs> you know, just basically a lot of teenagers talking about sex. And um, I was like, really? Can we, can we do a query? And he's like, well, yeah, sure. What do you want to know? And I said, give me every case where somebody had said broke up or dumped me. 
Okay. Nowadays, this is really trivial on Twitter. With, with Twitter, like this project that took me like a half year to build would be like a five minute like Python script. But at the time, you, it was difficult, and you know, you basically say for all the blogs, give me all the blog posts where someone just broke up or dumped me. Then we filtered that through Kummel's special language, special natural language processing tools, which um, would be able to distinguish which blog posts containing those terms were actually, in fact, a romantic breakup as opposed to, for example, someone dumped Pepsi on me or my favorite band broke up. Right? So we ended up with um, about uh, 100,000 blog posts that we were 90, of which we were each one 90% confident that it represented a, a romantic breakup. So we compiled, I did this visualization of all the romantic breakups uh, from 2005 and basically uh, launched it on Valentine's Day 2006. Um, <clears throat> And just, uh, just kind of, there was a bunch of markups where, where you could, for every given breakup, you could find other ones that were similar. The premise being that, that when you're a teenager and you've, you've, you have this romantic pain, you feel like no one else could possibly understand like your pain, which is so unique. And yet, actually, there's like, you know, 100 people who are describing their, their romantic breakup in exactly the same way as you. Bueno, can you bring me a coffee? There's a lot of different approaches, just black is fine. Um, image averaging, for example, is a quick little technique you can use that um, you may be familiar with from some of Jason Salavon's work. I'll show some. Uh, and what it does is basically, you, suppose you have a small, uh, small multiple collection, a collection of, of images of, of things. You can average all those images together and ostensibly in some way illustrate the category itself. Uh, it may suffer from poverty of details, but it may still offer an excellent gestalt. Doing so requires 10 lines of code. I'd be happy to give it to you. So, this is famous work by Nancy Burson. Uh, while an artist in residence at MIT in the early 80s and late 70s, she invented the, the technique of morphing that you may know, um, where you know one image is blended with another. <clears throat> so she was hanging out in the computer science uh, labs, and she wondered if it was possible to basically create averages of people's faces. And it wasn't just any old faces. She decided to apply a kind of a conceptual rule. She said, I want to create averages of beautiful women from the 1950s and beautiful women from the 70s. So here are the first and second beauty composites. On the left, Betty Davis, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Sophia Loren, and Marilyn Monroe, averaged together. On the right, the composites of Jane Fonda, Jacqueline Bisset, Diane Keaton, Brooke Shields, and Meryl Streep. And we end up with, putatively or ostensibly, the average beauty of the 1950s compared with the average beauty of the 1970s. I actually think it's pretty good. Kind of these are not individual people, right? There is nobody who actually looks like this. This is very early digital imaging for what, what she was trying to do. Um, but by, by morphing them this way, she was able to kind of get at these underlying notions of, of, of beauty. Um, she did other work as well. Um, more, more recently, in the early 90s, she, uh, oh, thanks. Um, she put out uh, uh, an advertisement on Craigslist saying, do you look like Jesus? If so, I'm going to photograph you. Um, so she got like eight guys who, like, who self-report as looking like Jesus. She averaged them together and the composite is in the lower right. Doesn't he look like Jesus? Sure looks like Jesus. Um, he looks more like Jesus than any of the individual, right? Where aggression toward the mean would say that he does. Um, what's funny about this is that nobody knows what the fuck Jesus looks like. Right? But we all have this kind of idea of what he looked like because of, you know, Byzantine art and other kinds of kind of conventional representations of Jesus and so forth. So she gets at our cultural idea of Jesus in kind of in interestingly roundabout way. Um, this is a project by a former grad student of mine, Dave Tinapple. Um, it's video faces. Uh, what you're seeing here are, uh, he, run, he ran the Open TV face tracker on uh, different television channels for an entire day. Okay, from it clockwise from upper left, PBS, CNN, Black Entertainment Television, HBO, HBO Adult, and HBO Adult. Uh, here's Fox, FNC, CNN, Friends, and MTV. Um, so, you know, PBS, kind of old white male. You know, HBO Adult, kind of a more more feminine face, perhaps. Um, can you guys can you guys see it as indistinct as it is? It's a mixture here. It's a mixture of, of visualizing both the actual you know faces that typically characterize a cable channel, as well as unfortunately 
uh, kind of a visualization of the open CV face detector itself, right? It, 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 he almost ran it too long. It ends up just kind of being kind of average of the work. But you do, in some sense, see the you know the face of white male authority on on Fox. You see you see the kind of the, the, the you know the face of youth on MTV and, and so on. Okay. This is a classic one by Jason Salvan. How many of you know this one? Uh, it's really good. Um, so this is called the Playboy Centerfold by Decade. Uh, each decade has uh, 10 years. Each year has 12 months. So for the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, he took 120 images for each of all the centerfolds of Playboy and averaged them together. OK? So you guys follow, right? And what, what kind of trends do we see here in uh, ideal feminine beauty across you know, four decades of Playboy? Well, we see a progressive trend towards women who are thinner, paler, and blonder. Um, and the images themselves have almost this kind of like shroud of Turin kind of look to them, just because the way they're added together. So uh, a kind of a, 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 a representation of, of um, changing tastes in, in ideal female beauty as, as represented through um, significant abstraction. Um, even better, perhaps, are his 100 special moments. Um, he befriended a Sears photographer. You know, one of these like uh, shopping mall photographers. You know, uh, so on the left is a hundred kids sitting on Santa's lap, average together. On the right, a hundred weddings. And what he shows us here are the ways in which um, the special moments in our lives, the ones that we think are are really unique and ours, are in fact kind of structured by these kinds of cookie cutter patterns, um, right? Uh, in the and, and you know the, the male uh, is always about four inches taller than the female. He's positioned on the right. They're clasping hands. You know, you kind of have this this kind of picture of of the way in which your wedding, which you thought was truly unique and truly your own, was actually really just structured in this kind of automated way. Um, uh, little leaguers and the graduates. Where's mom? Right. On the right side. Yeah. Are we smiling? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're happy. Um, homes for sale from different re different regions, uh, collected from um, uh, automatically collected from from online uh, sources. <clears throat> from a series begun in 1997, the prints in the suite are the result of mean averaging a specific number of realtor photos of single family homes for sale. What does the average home look like in Seattle, Tacoma, or in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth? Sorry, the colors aren't saturated as they should be, but you can see where, where, it, where you might prefer to live or not. Um, every frame from a Hitchcock movie by Jim Campbell. This is um, The Wizard of Oz. Every frame averaged together. Blue sky, technicolor, pink face. Um, this one is kind of poetic. Uh, <clears throat> this is Jim Campbell meditating with a camera held at a Buddha for several hours, or two hours perhaps. And um, it's the, the average of his own movement as he tries to focus on this. Image alignment. Um, you can do this automatically. Uh, on the left, Tag Vision by Neil Kandel Gaonkar um, is a fellow who took uh, images from, of, of the Eiffel Tower from Flickr and of eyes from Flickr and averaged them together. This one I like a lot, it's by Idris Khan. It's every Barrington Hillebecker prison type gas holder, every Barrington Hillebecker spherical type gas holder, and every Barrington Hillebecker gable sided house. Um, this is a video that, that deserves to be seen, and I, I can show it to you later. It's by Cassandra Jones. Um, she collected hundreds of, of images of sunsets um, and then so aligned them in time as to recreate a sunset by sequencing them correctly. You can actually see the sun setting across thousands of images. Um, it required a lot of scaling and translating and rotating in order to get all the horizons to line up and all the suns to, to line up over time. <clears throat> That's what it looks like. Uh, she also has done some car fires. I'll have to show the videos you know, in a little while later. Um, uh, let's get that one. Um, oh, uh, my friend Chris 
figure she she collected pictures of people giving the middle finger and um, organized them to be so so aligned as well. She organized she basically um, lined up and scaled and translated and rotated all the middle fingers and then showed the video of hundreds of people giving the camera the middle finger, but the middle finger stays the same and then the photograph just changes around it. You guys understand? Uh, it was a quick student project she did for Zach Lee Moon like years ago. Uh, what do faces reveal? I'm 40 now, and now I'm now I'm finally responsible. Abraham Lincoln said, after age 40, every man is responsible for his face. The story goes that a guy came in to interview for a job with Abe Lincoln, and Abe Lincoln you know, said, oh, okay, no thanks. And Abe Lincoln's <clears throat> secretary said, how come you didn't hire that guy on paper? He's perfectly qualified. And Lincoln said, I don't like his face. And this is an astonishing thing for his secretary to hear because, you know, that's like, like honest Abe. This is like, you know, Abe Lincoln saying, you don't like his face. What kind of answer is that? You know, and the answer is after age 40, every man is responsible for his face. The implication is that our faces are somehow visualizations of our inner character. There is some truth to the old wives' tale that grimacing can be permanent. The faces of the chronically depressed wrinkle differently than the faces of those who smile a lot. We can at least say that a person's face is a, certainly a visualization of its own history of movement. This is a project by a young woman, Eva Teppa, which I like a lot. It was shown at Ars Electronica 2005. Mm. It's one of my, my favorite visualizations ever. Um, I'm a big nerd. I like to program an open framework, as you can tell from my new open framework t-shirt. Um, if someone said to me, Golan, I want you to do a visualization of an orchestra. Let's say, you know, create a, a visualization of, of orchestral music. I'd probably think to myself, okay, I need to get a sound card with like 24 inputs and like mic every single player and then like get some crazy FFT code and a bunch of computer graphics and I'll hop the bone up on my shaders in order to like do some fantastic, you know, abstract hoo-ha. Eva Tepa does amazingly efficient visualization, which works as follows. Um, these five people are listening to the orchestra in another room. Um, and as they do, their faces reveal their personal reactions to the music as they hear it. These are then automatically assembled together by a kind of a video splicing system. Okay, so they're just kind of five live feeds are combined into one kind of very long projection. So the music that you're hearing is being visualized by these five faces. And the face is a highly multidimensional piece of meat. Um, it wrinkles in all sorts of interesting ways. And as you um, observe these people's faces, you begin to realize that, that some of the same things in the, movie, in the music that are moving you also are moving one of those people in the same way. You say, oh, I really associate with that guy. But when, when, when I sort of wince or cringe or enjoy the music, uh, I feel the same way that person feels. Their faces and their facial expressions become these highly multidimensional guides to what you're listening to. At the same time, there's a set of small multiples here. Not every one of these people react, react the same way. And you may say to yourself, I have no idea what that guy's up about. I don't understand the way he reacts at all. Jokes happen where you suddenly see one, these group of people are unaware of each other. They're not seeing each other. They're in five different rooms. Each, each person, um, sometimes they, they react together in coincidental unison. Other times, one person is reacting on their own, and you're just like, what is that person about? What are they listening to? And suddenly, their face clues you into different things that you may not have heard before in the music. So, Eva Keppa is using these faces as very rich displays, filtered through the five personalities of their owners for the content, the highly abstract content of this Elliot Sharp music. You guys understand? It's, it's amazingly affecting and very, very present. Um, why am I showing you this? This is a, a visualization technique called Chernoff faces. It's one of the many different ways of, of visualizing data. It's simultaneously kind of a, it's a favorite, and it's also it's got, it's got flaws. No one, no one thinks it's, it's perfect, but it's got some charm. Um, uh, the idea of Chernoff faces is the recognition that the human face is something that we have a lot of wetware devoted to processing. Each of us as a human being have been processing human faces since we were very small. 
And with the exception of people who have, you know, prosopagnosia or other, other kinds of, of uh, weird, you know, kind of mental disorders where they, they can't, like, actually remember or understand or process faces. There's various kinds of aphasia that, you know, affect you. Most people have been studying faces their whole lives and are acutely tuned in to small changes in ex expression and also who's, who's, uh, who's our kin, right? We can look at someone and say, oh, I'm probably closely related to that person or not, right? Um, so what we can do is we can take highly multidimensional data and we can map it to the generation of synthetic faces. This borders on some of the synthetic stuff, generative stuff we were talking about last week, right? In which um, one variable, for example, is used to talk about the separation of the eyes. Another variable is used to talk about the width of the cheeks. And another variable controls whether it's a smile or a frown and how, how smiley or how frowny it is. Another variable controls the length of the nose and so forth. And when, when this happens, we can suddenly use our wetware to quickly spot a stranger. Because our brains are good at that. You guys see? So this is how we can collapse highly multidimensional data into um, situations where it's easy for us to spot data that's out of place. Um, I hope I have the example here, because I have another example that I have to show you. Uh, but moving on, holism is a term that I come up with for talking about uh, presenting an, 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 a completely exhaustible or finite data set in its entirety. Early on. These are visualizations which, taken as wholes, organically reveal the influence of a complex set of forces. This kind of information metabolism, where you feed data to a system and it shows it to you. Um, here is um, a set of erosion blocks by Michael Joachim Gray. These blocks show you every possible configuration of removing a face from a cube. Right? So in the lower left, we have the basic condition of a cube, which is a rectangular solid, which is whole. Then one side has been removed, either, the, the, either one of the long sides or one of the short sides. Then two sides have been removed, either two of the long sides or a long side and a short side, and so forth. Finally, we work our way down almost a periodic table of form to the condition on the right-hand side, that sort of potato, is a situation where every single side has been removed. You guys follow? And short of that, where, where five sides have been removed and so on. So it's a kind of a periodic table of form. He's shown every possibility. There's no, there's no element missing. Right? He's gone through a series of, of combinatorics to arrive at this complete set. Um, pewter blocks describe essential sculptural conditions in three dimensions. For gray, they stand as metaphors for states of matter, for qualities of matter, for the senses that perceive matter, for the 20 amino acids, and for the strategies of vegetable and animal morphology. The sculpture's crown is the last block, which is formally likened to a philosopher's stone, a brain, and a potato the joining of animal, mineral, and vegetable states. Tim Hawkinson, alphabetized soup. Take every letter in your alphabet soup, sort it. Actually, there's many more I's than other letters. This is the actual framed work. We've got kind of this extra thing here so you can, you can show all the I's. It's okay to go off the, off the chart. Sometimes it's necessary. Jason Salavon, who did the image averaging before, uh, Whoa, one time ago now. What is that, 15 years ago? Um, scanned uh, his entire body. And uh, the entire surface, surface area of the artist's body is printed to scale in this photograph. It consists of 13,000 half-inch squares of skin and hair, rearranged vertically by luminosity from light to dark, or dark light. The resulting self-portrait is configured to, reconfigured so as to reveal the most intimate physical details while obliterating individual identity. Another example is, again, by Tim Hawkinson is a photo collage called Paper, in which he's photographed his body and in half-inch wide horizontal strips and redistributed them in a loop according to width from the narrowest tip of the pinky at the top to the widest section of my waist at the bottom. Um, a fantastic project involving a survey. Um, again, uh, producing a kind of a holism, as you'll see, but in a very different way. Um, how many of you know this project called Most Wanted Paintings by Kamar Melamed? That's a good one. Um, so a couple of artists, Kamar and Melamed, they're from Russia, they um, and joined a survey organization, and they conducted surveys using this kind of web form and also using telephone surveys. And they asked people questions about art to, ask, to assess their, their, uh, their tastes. They said, do you prefer 
wild animal or domestic animal in painting? Do you prefer indoor scenes or outdoor scenes in painting? Um, <clears throat> which of the following outdoor scenes appeals to you about forest, water, rural scenes, cities, buildings? Um, which season would you like to see depicted in a painting? Winter, spring, summer, or fall? Do you prefer paintings that are religious or not religious? What kind of objects do you like? And they would ask other questions as well. What's your favorite color? Okay, Blue, for example, predominant in the United States. And how about the size of paintings? Do you prefer larger paintings or smaller paintings? Um, the options here being, uh, if large paintings, full wall, full-size refrigerator, or dishwasher size. Or a small painting, the size of a paperback book, a magazine, or a 19-inch television. Okay. Once they've taken these surveys, and there's more um, things like outdoor scenes or indoor scenes, forest, lakes, and rivers, winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, do you prefer seeing brush strokes or cans that look smooth? Do you like historical figures and so forth? Lots of different kinds of surveys that they, they took, wild animals and things. They produce the most wanted painting. Right? It's straightforward. You just, you just take the survey results and you implement it. <laughs> there you are. It's got nature. It's got, what is it, summer or spring. It's got some wild animals. It's got a historic figure. It's got children because we like children. Okay, it's mostly blue and some green. There you are. It's the most wanted painting. You can also produce the least wanted painting. <laughs> Um, and you can do this for different countries. And we can begin to make a small multiple series of the most wanted and least wanted paintings from these different countries. Uh, from, from top to bottom, United States, France, Turkey, um, Russia, Denmark, I'm not sure what KD is, uh, Portugal, Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands. Netherlands being one of the only places whose preferred favorite image is actually abstract. Yeah. And Italy, where their least wanted painting has uh, pop culture figures and also kind of classical figures. They just can't, they, they're overburdened by their history. They can't stand it. Um, OK. Um, this is a, a digital project by Kevon Davis. Uh, it's a really great project. And it's, um, at this point, probably 10 years old. And I wish it were still online. There are parts of it that are still online, but, but the original alphabet one is done. <clears throat> It's very simple. He has he presents you with this grid, and he says the collective consciousness of the world. This is now an old project. This, when, this, when this arose, this was like early, early crowdsourcing before the term crowdsourcing even was called that. Um, the name hadn't even been neologized yet. He said to people, uh, the collective consciousness of the world is attempting to create the letter A. Should the orange pixel be black or white? Okay, we choose a random pixel, and you would say whether it should be black or white. And in this case, maybe you'd say white or water black or whatever it might be. And you could change it or flip a, a given random pixel maximum three times before your IP address would then block from further addressing that letter. Okay? After 12,025 flips, this is what the collective consciousness had produced. The hive mind had created this letter A. And on the bottom, you can see the complete uppercase alphabet uh, from 2004. Um, as it had been designed. And as you can see, there, what's interesting is he, he later shows animations of the, of the history of these things. You can see, you can view these as an animation. There is argument and negotiation and, and kind of disagreement about whether, for example, um, these things should have serifs or not. You know, the core part of the letter is black. The non-core part of the letter is, you know, is white. But there's disagreement at the edges where it twinkles and people are like, no, I assert that there should be serifs. No, I assert that there should not be. And so there's kind of a kind of constant disagreement that happens at the fringes. This project I'll show after the break. Um, this one by Lisa Jeffbrat is worth mentioning. This is only a very small fraction of a much larger project called Every One to One. Um, she pinged every IPv4, every IPv4 address. Okay, so you know your, your IP address is like, you know, 198.168.2. something that. Okay. She pinged every single IP address, and uh, according to what signal came back, um, uh, colored an image according to that. So she made a big, a big image, 65,000 by 65,000 pixels. Okay, it has two to the 32nd pixels in it. Very large image. Yeah. Uh, I had a friend who did something similar um, while I was doing your network, and he got a lot of calls from like government agencies wondering why universities. 
Did mm -hmm. something similar happen in this case? She did this a long time ago, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know any anecdotes about that. Um, <clears throat> you could ask her. She's from, she's a professor out in California um, of data visualization and art. Uh, I, she did this project at least 10 years old. So like, I, I think, like 2003, 2004, when we got nine or 10 years old. Um, but yeah, so she pinged every every single IP address, and, and depending on the signal that came back, you know whether it was uh, it was alive or dead, you know, kind of a, a website or not, she would color it in different ways, and she ended up with a picture of the internet, right, of the complete internet, literally, because she had pinged every single IP address. We're narrowing in on the, on the uh, on, I know it's time for a break, but let me just mention this one here. Here's a project I like a lot. It's called Everything. Um, by Tom Friedman. And uh, he spent three years writing every single word in the dictionary on a piece of paper that's three feet by three feet. Okay, So you can do this. It takes a while. There's approximately a quarter million words in the dictionary. And you write them all very small with ballpoint pen on a piece of, on a piece of paper. It's a picture of everything. Right? What's that lyric from Pink Floyd? All that you are, all that you breathe, right? It's literally a picture of everything you could possibly imagine, or that has ever been imagined, or that has ever had a name, right? or has ever had a, any kind of word that could describe it. All pictured on a big sheet of paper. So it's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of a, uh, an amazing object. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Like I said, this is a bluter lecture. We're halfway through. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's time for break. So we'll leave it there for now. Um, other questions? It's, it's 1019. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to finish this one, this lecture today, uh, and show you a bunch of, of digital stuff as well, of course. And then on, on Wednesday, we'll talk about the techniques for grabbing data, getting, getting data from places, and things like that.